my husband Alvin works from home like many of you or you probably have since the pandemic started um, and sometimes he gets the privilege of working from home when me and my two-year-old are also home and having dance parties in the living room so to combat that chaos he puts on his own music and strangely enough he likes to listen to these instrumental movie scores so the annoying thing about some of these movie scores is that the music will build for like five minutes straight. <laughs> so there's like this sense that something is going to happen, but you don't know like what it is or when it's going to happen. So you're just waiting. Um, so it creates like this feeling of tension. So you're just tense this whole time. And sometimes in this, these songs, the tension lasts a really long time. It's great for movies when you're watching them, but it's pretty annoying outside of that. So most of us don't like this feeling of tension. We don't want to live in this liminal or this in-between space. And if you're like me, you often want to retreat or turn it off or to pray for the music to speed up so you can get to the other side of it. But in our passages today, particularly in Ezekiel and in Luke, we find the people of God exactly there, sitting in that tension. So when we look at the passage in Ezekiel, we find the Jewish prophet is living in exile after the destruction of the first temple and the capture by the Babylonians with the rest of the people of Israel. So the people of Israel are despondent. They're losing hope for God's redemption. Then God takes Ezekiel up in the spirit and places him in a valley of dried bones. He's already despondent, and God places him in a valley of dried bones. So all around him, Ezekiel sees death and darkness. One commentary notes that the prophet can see nothing but dried bones, leading him to this overwhelming realization that he is in a place where death holds triumph. But... There's also tension building in this passage. You can almost sense it. We know that something maybe could happen, but things are just so dark right now, it's hard to see the what and the how just yet. So Ezekiel is in this liminal space. Arnold Van Gennep was the 19th century ethnographer who coined the term liminality. It actually comes from this Latin word that means threshold, like the threshold of a doorway when you're in between two rooms. The word evokes this sense of being unmoored, of uncertain, or being adrift. Van Gennep had studied tribal groups around the world, and he became fascinated with their rites of passage. He believed that cultural rites of passage, or these transitional periods in life, of a human take a three-part form. So there's this preliminal stage, which is the known life or whatever the person was before. And then there's this liminal stage or this ambiguous transition period. And when a person is separated from their initial identity. And then the third stage is this post-liminal stage. And in that, this is where the person's in a new and transformed state of being and they're reintegrated into their community with a new status. We see examples of this in our culture when we send our our young adults off to college. Maybe you send them far away from home, and they're mostly left to fend for themselves in this liminal stage. Then they graduate, they return, and they're reintegrated into our communities with a new adult identity. Specifically, though, I want to focus on the second stage, because this is where we find Ezekiel and the people of Israel in this passage. And I think it's where we find some of ourselves today. We're in this transitional or liminal space. Van Gennep actually goes on to further describe the feeling of being in this space by saying, the experience of liminality is the feeling of loss of steady and familiar landmarks. That kind of security that accompanies the past structure even as the future has not yet materialized. And then with everything in flux, this angst or this tension becomes the predominant mood. 
maybe this resonates with you just a bit. This season of Lent may even be amplifying some of those feelings. Maybe you expected your life to go in a certain direction, but something changed, and now you don't really know what to do. Or perhaps a friend or family member you thought would always be there has stepped away. Maybe you initially believed something about Christianity, and you're not so sure about that belief anymore. You might be in a liminal space. In addition to so many of these personal transitions, we see so much going on in the world. There's been so much change in the last couple of years. Probably one of the biggest is a global pandemic that significantly disrupted our norms and it sort of pushed us into this unsettled world that none of us had really transversed before, or traversed. And now it seems that every other day there's a new problem. There's another mass shooting There's children still sleeping in cages in detention centers. There's another woman trapped in a life of trafficking, struggling to get out. Another historically black church attacked by arsonists. Another law passed that harms an already vulnerable group in our society. With all this going on, the work may seem daunting. We may be growing weary, And we're wondering when we'll get to the other side of this. We're wondering if God is really going to change things. And it can be really hard not to despair. We might find ourselves stuck in a valley of doubt so deep that we're unsure if we're able to climb out. Ezekiel was there in that valley of dried bones, overwhelmed with the death all around him, holding on to so much doubt that even when the almighty living God, capable of unlimited miracles, asked him what should have been a really easy question with God right there, mortal, can these bones live? In other words, he's asking Ezekiel if he believed there was any way that things could change. And Ezekiel basically shrugs and says, I don't know, God, you know, you tell me. (laughs) And then in this text, we see this tension that Ezekiel sits in. He's wanting to believe because obviously he's following him. He followed him to this valley. I mean, he's showing up for church. He's making a point to talk to God, but he's just not able to get to belief yet. He couldn't see any way that things could change for the better. He was in a liminal space. And then from our gospel reading today, in John chapter 11, we see Martha having similar struggles. Her brother Lazarus is sick and dying. So here in verse 3, she sends a message to Jesus with full belief and confidence that Jesus can heal the sick. She's seen this. She hopes that he will come to heal Lazarus quickly. And in fact, Jesus sends a message right back to her saying, this illness does not lead to death. But Jesus does not go quickly. Verse 5 says that though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place that he was, and Lazarus dies. Though he loved them, he did not do what Martha was expecting him to do. Imagine being in Martha's place, wholeheartedly believing that someone is capable of doing something about your desperate situation, taking them at their word that they will, and then the shock and hurt experience when they don't. Now, what can she believe? We see Martha here catapulted into this liminal space. This person of unwavering faith, changed by the unexpected death of a beloved brother and disappointment in her savior. Stuck in a place of struggle, somewhere between doubt and belief. 
we begin to see this back and forth just a few verses down. When Jesus finally makes his way to Bethany, Martha runs out to meet him and throws her disappointment at him in her words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then in a moment, directly following that pain, just a glimmer of faith breaks through. And she acknowledges that even now, God will give him what he asks. Do y'all see the struggle that she's going through right now? Wanting to believe and trying to get there. And then she doesn't specifically ask for Lazarus to be raised. Is that what she wants? Does Martha know what she wants anymore? Or is this she just afraid to be disappointed again? And throughout the rest of the story, we see the back and forth struggle that Martha is engaging in. Later in verse 24, Jesus tells Martha that her brother will rise again. And he says to her, do you believe this? And Martha's response, similar to Ezekiel's response to God in the Valley of Dried Bones, was that she avoids a direct answer. Martha's in a liminal space. And friends, maybe you once wholeheartedly believed something that you were so sure was true and were disappointed when you found out that it wasn't. Or you had expectations for someone that didn't quite pan out. Maybe, like Martha, Jesus disappointed you. Or other people did. Maybe so much time has passed that the hope for what you wanted so badly is dead. If that is you, then maybe Jesus is reminding you today that whatever that thing is, it will rise again. Reminding you that he is the resurrection and the life. That hope that you had, that faith that you had, that dream that appears unattainable, though it might seem dead, yet can it live. And his question to you, like to Martha, is, do you believe this? And if you can't quite make the jump to yes immediately, that's okay. Neither did, Mark, did Ezekiel or Martha. I remember when I was young, my mom would make us watch all of these civil rights era movies. And of course, at that time, I would have rather probably watched Nickelodeon, but 90s kid, obviously. But I guess she was prophetic and just trying to make sure we got an accurate account of history before it was too late. Anyway, in so many of these movies and documentaries, I would see these white supremacist groups burning crosses in the front yards of black families in the name of Christianity. And in the very next scene or next part of the documentary, I would see the black community meeting up in a church to pray. Even as a kid and a young teen, I wondered how these families could ascribe to the same religion as those who burn crosses in their yard. How could they worship the same Jesus? Especially when it seems like Jesus is allowing these things to happen. No doubt they were praying for it not to. Did they not sense this tension, this struggle to hold on to the same God that was delaying his redemption? So I would ask my parents and the older women in the church, we called them church mothers, and they would just say, sometimes you just have to tarry a while and hold on until your change comes. So Webster's Dictionary defines tarry as to linger in expectation. But in the black church, tarry means something a little bit more. It means to wrestle in anticipation. There's a struggle involved, a little bit of a fight. So in essence, those women acknowledged that my question was hard and that I would have to wrestle with that. But they encouraged me to hang on to the faith until things changed, like so many generations before had already done. Paul Gilroy, a a black post-colonial theorist, put it this way. He said, my people have an obligation to find hope 
even in hopeless situations. But maybe what has moved you into this liminal space is this deep desire for change, but a resistance to something that God has been gently asking you to do. You know that in order to grow, you cannot stay where you are, but doubt or fear keep you from heeding that still, small voice. That voice that would lead you from the wilderness to this new identity in the community of Christ. What is he asking you today? Is he asking you to simply walk with him despite your lingering doubt? Or is he asking you to do something more tangible? Maybe to respond to a call to do something that you don't feel quite qualified for? Maybe it's to speak kinder words to your spouse. Or maybe it's something a little bit deeper. Something that you wouldn't say out loud but that God wants you to address? Is it to finally reach out to a therapist about that simmering anger issue? Or to make friends with someone who doesn't look like you or isn't in the same tax bracket just for the sake of being friends? And then we know that 81% of human trafficking victims are trafficked by family or intimate partners. Is he calling you to speak out about the subtle signs of abuse you might be observing in a neighbor or a friend or a family member. Or maybe God is asking you to pay more attention to that subtle feeling of superiority you feel when you're, asked, when you're around someone that you think you should be better than and ask yourself why. that tension that you feel right now may actually be the Holy Spirit desiring to help you get to the other side. Will you keep following God through this tension? And that's the thing, y'all. You don't have to do it alone. In a few final notes about the rites of passage that he observed, Van Gennep wrote, the ethnographer, In a rite of passage, there's always a way in, and there's a way out, and there's a trusted guide to help you through. We don't have to fear the unknown in this liminal space, in the space of tension, because we have a trusted guide who knows the way and will lead us out. Ezekiel and Martha have both been there. They were with you. God led Ezekiel around the valley of dried bones, and Jesus led Martha to the tomb of Lazarus. But they both tarried with those doubts, and they held out until God acted on their behalf, and they saw death defeated and the dead brought back to life. The good news for us today is that we get that same opportunity. When we come to the table, you can bring all those doubts. You can bring that tension. You can bring that uncertainty. And Jesus still guides us through the wilderness to the tomb and finally to share in his resurrection. Amen.